And so many in the black community, if I'm being honest with you, because I want to be, believe that you are being used as a pawn by the right and that you're a charlatan of sorts. He's, he's not a Republican. So how do you... Who, who, he's never voted you, 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 you. Just straight up calling him a charlatan to his face. Whoopi Goldberg, Joy Behar, and Sonny Hostin are all on this episode. Yeah, we have an all-star team for this one. And they're once again having an absolute meltdown over... Once again, the same old woke talking points. This time, they brought on an author, Coleman Hughes, on his definition of colorblindness when it comes to race, and they were very, very angry at this guy because he apparently wrote a book that stated that we should try our best to not be racially biased and stuff like that, but it might seem like it's kind of a woke book. It's actually, in fact, the opposite. And Whoopi Goldberg, Joy Behar, and Sonny Hostin took exception to that. So anyway, let's get into this clip here from The View of them absolutely melting down over this guy, Coleman Hughes' book, and he just absolutely destroys them live on this episode of The View. First question that I should ask you to, to, to do is explain to folks what you mean by this. Arguments for a colorblind America. What do you mean when you say that? So a lot of people equate colorblindness to I don't see race mm -hmm. or to pretending not to see race. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big mistake. We all see race, mm -hmm. right? And we're all capable of being racially biased, so we should all be self-aware to that possibility. My argument is not for that. My argument is that we should try our very best to treat people without regard to race, both in our personal lives and our public policy. Of course. And the reason I wrote this book, thank you. you can the reason I wrote this book is because in the past 10 years, it has become very popular to, in the name of anti-racism, mm -hmm. teach a kind of philosophy to our children in, in general that says your race is everything, right? And I think that is the wrong way to fight racism, and that's why I wrote this book at this time. Can I, I'm sorry, baby. Can I just point out that there is a reason for that? You know, when I went to school, getting any information about anyone's race was not taught. No history, there was no black history. None of those things were taught And here in America 100 years ago when I was a young woman. <laughs> that's how people... It's better when there's no black history because... If there is such a thing as black history, then that already divides us as it is. Like the term black history, black history month, black national anthem, all this stuff is just made to divide us further. It's all just American history. Like the reason why there was no black history because there wasn't an agenda in place back then to divide us, or at least not, this, not to the same extent as there is now. So it's better when there's no black history and not because I don't think, you know, black people should exist in history or anything like that, because it's better when it's all just American history, because we're all Americans. People saw you. That's how they judged you. So I think it's, I don't want to say it's the, your youth, but I think you have a, a point, but I think you have to also take into consideration what people have lived through in order to understand why there has been such a, a, a pointing of very specific racial things. Like women couldn't go to get into colleges. If you were a black person, there were a lot of colleges wouldn't accept you. Trying to equal the playing field. I think that's what a lot of folks were, have been trying to do. I'm sure, sorry, I didn't sure. to cut you. I think that's your experience and, and that's valid. You know, as a counterpoint, mm -hmm. when I was in fifth grade, we all watched Roots mm -hmm. together yeah. in, in public school. Yeah. So these are different experiences. I, yes. I think it's also different generations. Mm -hmm. It's different parts of the country, mm -hmm. right? We have very different cultures all living together in one yes. country. So I'm not going to deny that. But I think I view this notion of a colorblind society similar to the idea of a peaceful society, which is to say it's an ideal. It's a North Star. Mm -hmm. And the point is not that we're ever going to get there. We're not going to touch it. But we have to know when we're going forward and when we're going backwards. And we're going backwards when we're doing woke kindergarten in San Francisco, uh, you know, with, with, you didn't hear about the story? No, you, no, but wait, 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 that address socioeconomic differences would be better at benefit, benefiting disadvantaged groups and that race-based policies often hurt the very people they're trying to help. What are some, some examples of policies that would be better at reducing uh, racial disparities? So my overall argument is that class, socioeconomics, is a better proxy for disadvantage. We all want to help the disadvantaged. And the question is, how do we identify them, right? The default right now in, in, in a lot of areas of policy is to use you know, black and Hispanic identity as a proxy for disadvantage. And my argument- Exactly, which is extremely racist, by the way. Like, just to think that's because someone is black that they're disadvantaged, because, like, it, it's basically like, it's the white savior complex that they that they always talk about the woke side always talks about the funny thing is like they are the white savior like they are the one that are you know committing committing the racism like they are the ones that are doing that they are the ones that are furthering the racism because they're saying oh you're black or you're you're hispanic or something i must help you because i am superior it's like that doesn't have to be the case like that's actually extremely racist to do that argument is that you actually get a better picture of who needs help by looking at socioeconomics and, and income that that picks out people in a more accurate way but, and, and, not my question, but when you say that uh, socioeconomics picks out people in a better way than mm -hmm, race, mm -hmm. when you do look at the socioeconomics, you see the huge disparity between white households and black households. You see the huge disparity between white households and Hispanic households. So your argument, and I've read your book twice because I wanted to give it a chance, mm -hmm. um, your argument that race has no place in that equation is really fundamentally flawed. In my no, uh, well, there's two separate questions. One is whether each racial group is socioeconomically the same. Well, I agree with you, they're not. Yeah, they're course. not, and the stats the show that. But, yeah, of course, I agree with that fully. The question is, how do you, how do you address that in a way that actually targets Gets poverty the best but like what what is the what is the point in looking at it as just a race thing when it's 
obviously not. Like if the the thing that we're worried about is the, the, the poverty rates or the socioeconomic status instead of the race, the color of the skin, why not just look at the socioeconomic status and statistics when that 100% of the time is exactly what it is that we're looking for? Why make it a race thing whenever it's not all like, not all black people are poor. Not all white people are rich. There are some white people who are poor and some black people who are rich. So why do we have to make it a race thing when it's not 100% accurate? When if you look at the socioeconomic status itself, that is always 100% accurate. So I don't understand why these people like Whoopi Goldberg and Sonny Hostin and the rest of the view argue for it to always be a race thing when that's not even the most accurate way to look at things. It's not even going to give you the most accurate depiction of the country. If you look at simply the the socioeconomic status itself that will give you the most accurate picture. And it's not as divisive because it's just fact. Right. And what Martin Luther King wrote in his book, Why We Can't Wait, mm -hmm. is he called it, we need a bill of rights for the disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, we should address racial inequality. Yes, right. we should address the legacy of slavery. But the way to do that is on the basis of class. And that will disproportionately target blacks and Hispanics because they're disproportionately poor, but it will be doing so in a way that also helps the white poor, in a way that addresses poverty as the thing to be addressed. That part is true, but as you are a student of Dr. King, I'm not only a student of Dr. King, I know his daughter, Bernice, right? Mm. So I, I'm gonna get to my question. Go ahead, go right ahead. Um, I think the premise is fundamentally flawed. You, you claim that colorblindness was the goal. Notice how Sonny Hostin here changes the subject whenever he says something that makes complete sense and she has no rebuttal. He says, why not just focus on the issue of class so that not only do we help the Hispanics and blacks disproportionately to the whites, but we also help the poor, that the whites that are poor. And then she just, Sonny Hostin just totally changes the subject because she doesn't have a response. There is none, but she doesn't like that one because she doesn't want to help the white people. Of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Based upon Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, you know, content of character versus the um, color of skin. <laughs> Bernice, Dr. King's daughter, points out that four years after giving that speech, actually, um, Dr. King also said this, a society that has done something special against the Negro for hundreds of years must now do something special for Negroes. He also said in 1968, it was about less than a week before he was assassinated. This country never stops to realize that they owe a people kept in slavery for 244 years. So rather than class, he did write about that earlier on. Right before his death, he made the argument for racial equality and racial reparations. And so your argument for colorblindness, I think, is something that the right has co-opted. And so many in the black community, if I'm being honest with you, because I want to be, believe that you are being used as a pawn by the right and that you're a charlatan of sorts. He's, he's not a Republican. Oh, so how do you, he's never voted you, 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 Just straight up calling him a charlatan to his face. That's, you can see Joy Behar's reaction. Watch that back really quick. Watch Joy Behar's reaction to what Sonny Hostin just said. Believe that you are being used as a pawn by the right and that you're a charlatan of sorts. He's, he's not a Republican. So how do you, he's never voted you, 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 you said that you're a conservative. No, you, you, no. no, you did. You actually said that uh, in the podcast that you did two weeks ago. I said I was a conservative. He's not, he's yes, not. Yes. Even, that even made the other guest of The View or the other host of The View uncomfortable, what Sonny Hostin just did there. Straight up calling their guests on The View a charlatan to his face. And they're all just like, they all go in defense mode for him. That's just, that's crazy. And so, but my question to you, my question to you is, how do you respond okay. to those critics? Okay, let's give it a okay, so answer. Yes. First thing I, wanna, I, I think it's very important. The quote that you just pointed out about doing something special for the Negro, that's yes. from the book, Why We Can't Wait, that I, that I just mentioned. Yes. A couple paragraphs later, he lays out exactly what that something special was, yes. and it was the Bill of Rights for the Disadvantaged, a broad class-based po policy. But he also says okay. you must include race. <laughs> no, he didn't, he says it's Yes, a, he does. Okay, well, everyone can go, everyone should go read the book, Why We Can't Wait. Let's not get sidetracked by that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I don't think I've been co-opted by anyone. I've only voted twice, both for Democrats. Mm -hmm. Although I'm an independent, I would vote for a Republican, mm -hmm. probably a non-Trump Republican, if they were compelling. If you enjoy content like this, then make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. It really does help me out a ton. Let's get back to the video. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's any evidence I've been co-opted by Anyone, and I think that that's, that's a, an ad hominem tactic people use to not address really the important conversations we're having here. And I, I think it's better, and it would be better for everyone if we stuck to the topics rather than but make it about me. But with no, about no evidence you, but I, I, just, I want to give you the opportunity to respond yeah, to the, I, I appreciate your it. the criticism. I appreciate it. There's no evidence that I've been co-opted by anyone. I have an independent podcast. Mm -hmm. I work for CNN as an analyst. Mm -hmm. I write for the free press. I'm independent in all of these endeavors, and no one is paying me to say what I'm saying. I'm saying it because I feel it. Yes. Alyssa, you have the It's just ridiculous to me that Sonny Hostin, because he brought up a point of if like, why do we have to only address the blacks or Hispanics, only the non-whites? Why not just address class? And that way we disproportionately do help the blacks and Hispanics that are poor, but we also help the whites that are poor. And then Sonny Hostin just straight up gets emotional, 
at hominem attacks, you're a charlatan. Being here, so in the past decade, it feels like racial tensions have gotten worse. Um, do you see it that way, and what do you attribute it to? Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you look at all the data, it finds that race, race relations were getting better until about 2013. That year, you had majority of Black, Hispanic, and white Americans saying race relations were good, and then you just see it nosedive. And 2013, you know, people like to blame Republicans, like to blame Obama, it wasn't his fault. Mm -hmm. Democrats like to blame Trump. It, it was actually just technology. We all got social media and smartphones, and we had videos being promoted in the algorithm that were unrepresentative, and it created this impression that racism was on the rise when, in fact, it had been on the decline for decades. And it allowed that at all to foreign actors getting involved in technology? Uh, yes, Russia tries to meddle, absolutely, but I, think, I don't think we can blame foreign actors. This is a homegrown problem. Okay. I have a question, because you write that the anti-racism movement, there are a couple of people, I don't even know who they are, maybe. Robin D'Angelo. Yeah. Robin D'Angelo, yeah. Ibram Kendi, for instance. Okay, well, they, uh, you say that that is just a form of, another form of racism, and you even say it has a lot in common with white supremacy. How can you compare those two things? You, I compare you talk about them because... You're comparing it to white supremacy. Because they, they both view your race as an extremely significant part of who you are. So r white supremacists, they obviously say, we all know what they say, okay? Uh, Neo-racists like Rob D'Angelo, they say that to be white is to be ignorant, for example. Well, uh -huh. this is a racial stereotype, and I want to call a spade a spade and say this is not the style of anti-racism we have to be teaching our kids. We should be teaching them that your race is not a significant feature of you, who you are. Who you are is your character, your value, and your skin color doesn't say anything about that. Well, that's, that's actually misrepresenting so, what, what Robin D'Angelo's position is. It's in her book. But well, that's well, what, well, you notice how the audience starts applauding whenever that's said. And Sonny Hostin doesn't like it. Whoopi Goldberg doesn't like it. Joy Behar doesn't like it. You know, whenever he makes just very obvious statements, like your race, your color of your skin should not play a significant part in like judging a person. Like it just shouldn't. Like it's just a fact. It's everybody knows this, but it's, it's offensive to the host of The View, to Sonny Hostin and Whoopi Goldberg and the rest of them, whenever you say stuff like that, because they don't want to think that. They want to be racist. Like they, they straight up just are, man. Like, it, it's just, they're just disgusting people. Here we go. Okay. So here we go. <laughs> Thank you, Coleman Hughes, for coming, because this is a show of lots of different opinions, and mm -hmm. we are multi-generational, and we all got an opinion. It's not a show of a lot of different opinions. They all hold the same opinions. They're all, I think, paid off to, you know, spew this woke nonsense. What do you guys think about this? You know, even the, to the point where, you know, the other hosts of The View turned on Sonny Hostin, the fans of The View even applauded whenever all the hosts of The View were obviously, you know, a little bit angry and uncomfortable. The, the audience basically just turned on them. Let me know what you're thinking about Coleman Hughes' appearance, just shutting down all the nonsense that the woke, you know, The View said, you know, Sonny Hostin, Joy Behar, Whoopi Goldberg, and the rest of them. Let me know what you're thinking. If you did enjoy the video, please leave a like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I hope to see you guys on the next one.